Isn't that everyone's dream that we have a, a nonlinear pipeline, USD, for example, Omniverse, using that to, we do previous work with the filmmakers, we go on a virtual production stage, film the plates with the proper lighting, this becomes my post with my layout. I'm going in a real-time engine, in parallel, all the way through uh, to the point where I'm deciding, do I need a near real-time render or do I want an offline render of it? And then I'm rendering in it in my render software of choice. I don't know, Clarice, V-Ray, Renderman, Solaris, pick your battles and you comp it. That's everyone's dream, and I think a lot of companies are working in this direction at the moment because it will unlock so much more potential. It will unlock so much more efficiency. And if we're looking at how much content is being produced right now, efficiency is key. You are listening to The 21 Artist Show, a podcast that inspires creatives to make meaningful content to pursue their passion. I'm talking with creators, artists, and engineers about their careers, lessons they have learned, and how to make an impact. I'm your host, Alexander Richter. I'm a technical director and coach in visual effects, animation, and games. For more content, go to 21artistshow.com. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the 21 Artist Show. I'm currently here in Waikiki, Hawaii, and joining me today is Philip Wolf from DNEC in Montreal. Thank you for having you on the show, Philip. Great for having me, thank you. Philip is the executive in charge of corporate strategy at DNEC. And I think that would be also my first question to you is like, what does it mean to be the executive in charge of the corporate strategy at DNEC basically? It's a very interesting question because the, the thing is, this position did not exist before me. Uh, and, I, I, and, and it's actually really nice to have someone looking at what, what corporate strategy means. Corporate strategy in my role means I'm looking at at things which are in the future. What do we need today? Need to do today to to prepare us for what we have to do in five years. So be it, be it looking at uh, different kinds of deals with with companies and existing clients to finding different kinds of of clients to creating own IP to uh, using emergent technology uh, like real time engines. For, for ways we have maybe not yet just really explored them. Also, a lot of what I'm doing is, is educating filmmakers, working with filmmakers to see what kind of technologies we can use to solve their individual problems on their projects. It's, it's really, I think if you, wanna, if you wanna explain it in one, one word, it's kind of futurist. I always thought uh, as someone like who plans this kind of things is a kind of a CEO, C FO, CTO job maybe? How do you kind of interconnect with this role? In my role, I'm reporting directly to the CEO uh, and owner of the company. I'm working very closely with the CTO. I'm working very closely with our finance team, not with our CFO. But it's it's imagine it's a it's a position outside of the line. It's a position outside of the day to day. It's a position which actually has the capacity to look at how we do things with a bird's eye view. So even, even though um, I might produce a show here and there, I still have the possibility to take a step back. And as a, as a, for example, as a visual effects producer or my previous role as an executive producer, I was ingrained in the day to day. So sometimes you just don't see the, the, the trees in the forest because it's just so much going on all, all of the time. And especially at DNEC where, I mean, DNEC is now a company with artists worldwide. So we have fairly substantially big projects and it can quite easy become a picture of, okay, there's so much going on. There's this going on, there's this going on. I, you obviously have your production teams, you have your supervision teams, and they're all doing a stellar job in, in keeping everything, everything going. In my role, stepping back and looking, okay, this is how, how we've been doing visual effects. This is how we've been doing content production. This is how we've been telling stories. One of the, the interest pieces right now I have, I'm having is, is virtual production. So we all are aware of what's happening with virtual production, right? We've all watched The Mandalorian. We have all watched The Batman. We have all a pretty good idea on how an LED stage works. That's where some people's knowledge on virtual production ends. 
being able to see the actors point at things and see what they're looking at was pretty transformative. It gave everybody context with the added benefit that if you want to move a mountain from there to there, you can do it instantly. You could switch between the Iceland location to the desert location, all within the same day of shooting. The ability to shoot a 10 hour dawn is extraordinary. To shoot any sequence where you say, oh, this world's not quite right, let's just move it a little bit. An extraordinary number of benefits and advantages for shooting in that environment. It's mind blowing what that tool is. There are more technologies like something we've used on Fight Club previous. I think Fight Club was 1994. It's quite a while and it's still one of the like, most favorite movies for a lot of people, actually. Mm -hmm. And we used virtual production to figure out uh, how to build the house, what the production design needs to solve. I don't want to spoil the movie for whoever hasn't watched it, but um, it's, it's, it's really... 25 years ago. Yeah, you had your chance, right? <laughs> but production design had to solve the issue of uh, both characters can't be in the same room at the same time. So every room had an exit and an entry, or basically two exits. And they used previous and virtual production to figure this out, which is utterly, utterly impressive and really amazing. There were talks at FMX about it. There were, I bet there are podcasts around that topic. It's, it's really interesting to, to, to look at what virtual production was used. Then we have virtual production technology like Simulcam, where we, where we uh, use a, a previous scene and track it into, into what the camera sees and with that help filmmakers to actually frame for a CG creature, frame for a CG environment, which wasn't possible before because you're only looking at the green screen or a blue screen and an actor who was acting against a tennis ball really doesn't help. But now we have all of these possibilities. So what can we do with this next? How can we make this available for more people? Because at the moment, it's uh, you see the Batman, you see uh, Red Notice, you see, I don't know, a lot of Mandalorian, a lot of very, very big shows using this technology. How can we make this available for smaller, smaller productions? How can we make this available for independent filmmakers? How can we make this available for documentary filmmakers? That's a question I'm, I'm currently asking and trying to find answers for. Mm. Yeah, David Fincher is actually one of my favorite directors. It's actually every time a David Fincher movie is coming out, that's one of the things I want to see. Because one, one of the things that he does great, is including like Christopher Nolan, Tarantino, they, they know how to blend visual effects into their environment. And they kind of have, have this, this way of knowing exactly what works and what doesn't work a lot of times. And even through Fincher is very famous for his crazy camera movements, you know, his godlike going through a mux, uh, you know, kind of thing. But it still kind of works in this environment because he always wants to keep it as real as possible, even through maybe the movement is unreal. That's what I really like. And I think something like a virtual production or something like this kind of planning can help you to figure that out basically and make this kind of approach more visual, more concrete and in a way also easier to communicate with all departments, you know, what, how to set up things and stuff like that without maybe going too far in that. There is this department which I sometimes had in some companies where there was like a future research department basically. So they were always like dreaming up the next thing. It doesn't have to be like practical for now, but it was more of like if we look into the future, what could be done uh, in the next five years or something like that, that we can bring back to the company. When you have something, how do you approach that and how do you bring it back to the company as a, as a suggestion or as something that they can implement in the future? DNEC has a research and development team. We have a chief scientist, Oliver James, who worked together with a NASA scientists on the black hole for interstellar. And I think DNEC is one of the few, if not the only, visual effects companies having a scientist on staff. I literally had uh, Eugenie from Tutzelmann, who was one of the, the supervisor on the black hole for Interstellar at DNEC, actually. And she was working uh, with, with the physicist about that, like to develop that. So we actually had an episode about the black Amazing. hole in, in, uh, from DNEC in Interstellar. So kind of interesting that you kind of uh, bring that back to us. It's research and development can be the tool in five years, but it can also be a, a solve for, for a creative problem. It can be a solve for 
an image which hasn't been uh, been done before. If you look at uh, the creature at the end of Annihilation, which is is basically based on a Mandelbrot, or the creature in Moonfall, Roland Emmerich's last movie, which is also kind of a Mandelbrot-ish simulation. That's science. It's really math, and it's and and it's it's interesting where science and visual effects uh, combine. And I'm working very close with with Roy and his team because. Obviously, a lot of things I'm looking at don't exist in this fashion, are not being used like this. How can we uh, create an end-to-end -end pipeline for virtual production? Isn't it everyone's dream that we have a, a nonlinear pipeline, USD, for example, Omniverse, using that to, we do previous work with the filmmakers, we go on a virtual production stage, film the plates with the proper lighting, this becomes my post with my layout. I'm going in a real-time engine in parallel all the way through uh, to the point where I'm deciding, do I need a near real-time render or do I want an offline render of it? And then I'm rendering in it in my render software of choice. I don't know. Clarice, V-Ray, Renderman, Solaris. Pick your battles and you comp it. That's everyone's dream. And I think a lot of companies are working in this direction at the moment because it will unlock so much more potential. It will unlock so much more efficiency. And if we're looking at how much content is being produced right now, efficiency is key. A corporate strategy is more of a, as you said, I think like bird's eye view of things. And then the practical implementation will be the departments that will kind of do that, the technology department that will be actually implementing that element of that if we have an existing department then yes if we don't then it's 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 basically to build if you take an example like how would would it work like in in your job from from the start to you're finished mm. with that job and you move on to another uh, idea or let's take an example in, in in realms of virtual production sure i have a, a filmmaker I don't know, be it in, in India, be it in, in Hollywood, be it in China, be it wherever in the world, I don't mind. And this, this person calls and says, okay, okay, this, this is the movie I want to produce. I have a challenge, be it money, be it actor time, be it uh, complexity of, of visual effects, be it complexity of shoot, because sometimes a shoot can be utterly complex for not the biggest benefits. And then we, we sit down and go through it and, and try to figure out what can we do to make this problem go away? How can we use visual effects for that? How can we use virtual production technology for that? How can we use maybe real-time technology for that? And I'm talking movies sometimes don't even have visual effects in them. And they're, they're coming, coming to me asking, okay, what can we do to make this movie feasible? What can we do to break this down? And then we break it down, we budget it, we compare it to, to a, a classic budget. And based on this comparison, we take decisions or they take decisions. And this is where, where, where it then usually ends with an idea. If it's something like, okay, what can we do with, with virtual production? Um, those are ongoing things. It's, I'm talking on, on a regular basis with our virtual production department, with our research team about what can we do virtual production? How can we pu push it a little bit in this direction? What can we do in this direction? Is there a possibility to do X or Y? Sometimes my job is just asking stupid questions. Sometimes it's pointing at the obvious, but nobody wants to talk, at it, uh, talk about it. Sometimes it's, it's ignoring a fact. Sometimes it's, it's purely questioning a process we have been doing like 25 years ago, since 25 years. It's keeping open-minded. That's the majority of my job is being open-minded about processes, being open-minded about things we have been done in the past. It's, I, al I always say I'm a generalist with obsession to new knowledge challenging the status quo. I'd, I don't care if the power plug is designed in a way for a reason. I still question it. Can you show, like, show us an example of uh, some, some technology that you uh, helped implementing recently? I'm talking to the Producers Guild of America together with a team of people about virtual production for independent filmmakers. Because virtual production, and this is it's not really a tech, I, I can't talk about technologies implemented or anything, but I can talk about one, one of the things we're keeping the flag high 
to make sure that virtual production gets the attention it deserves as a new way, uh, actually not even as a new way, as a tool of filmmaking, as a tool of filmmaking, which is totally not for everyone, but as a tool of filmmaking, which doesn't need to be expensive. How big is that? When we look at, at, at what, what Stagecraft is doing for Mandalorian or, or, or the Star Wars series, it's obviously a very different scale, very different budget, very different background. Your iPhone is actually more for an example, which is, which is along the line. The thing is, LED volume, if you, as an independent filmmaker, let's say you have, I don't know, a $7 million movie. And as an independent filmmaker, you say, oh, would love to use a virtual production stage. You got to get a quote for a virtual production stage and you're like, I can't afford that. That's my whole movie, basically. Pretty much. It's a matter of perspective. A, like said, virtual production is not for everyone. It's virtual production is not a silver bullet. But virtual production can help you. Let's, let's assume, for example, half of my movie plays at sunrise. So my shooting schedule to shoot a movie at sunrise is going to look like, I don't know, an hour and a half every day over a period of 10 days, five days. You can shoot this on, a, on an LED stage where you can shoot 12 hours a day at sunset. And this suddenly makes a big, big, big difference because what you shot in, uh, before in five, six days, you can now shoot in one day. And suddenly the, the sticker shock, which comes with the, the rental of the stage and the people to run the stage, dissipates because every shooting day costs you quite a lot of money. And suddenly it, it's, it's really something which becomes a, a calculation which makes sense. But this is something we need to educate and this is something where we need to give filmmakers the tools. And that's something we are doing. We're giving the filmmakers the idea of, okay, this is, this is what you can do with it. And sometimes virtual production can, can be a 125-inch LED screen you bought at Best Buy, which is running Unreal Engine on a, on a gaming PC and you're tracking your camera with the tools you can download from the Epic Marketplace doesn't need to be expensive. It's just a question of how you use it. It's something, something I, I sometimes say is like, it's like you don't use a, a power drill to get a nail in the wall. Same as virtual, virtual production. It's what, what, is, what is the right tool I want to use? And suddenly it becomes, it, it becomes more achievable. Suddenly it becomes more of an option. So this is at the moment one of, one of the big things I can talk about. One of the most amazing things when you uh, lead a filmmaker on a LED stage or a virtual production stage for the first time and they realize what they can do with it. It's, it's, it's really, really great to see. And this goes from the most junior to the most senior filmmakers. It's really, really cool to see because there's so much opportunity, so much opportunity for stories we haven't even explored. When we start writing for virtual production, I think this is when, it, when we really see a paradigm shift happening. Are there like tools that you feel like uh, something that you could recommend for people who are maybe are not able to afford a con consultation with you or, or something like that, that you can say like this could be interesting tools that uh, an independent filmmaker could pick up even if they have a 50,000 budget or something like that? Absolutely. And, and first of all, everyone can always reach out to me. It's, it's completely fine. Everyone can always, if you have a project and you want consultation, um, You can always reach out to our new business team. Um, we're always there to help. We're always there to consult. We're always there to, to be a partner in this. What I would recommend is if you want to look at virtual production, go on vsglobal.org and go under resources onto the virtual production section. And you see a huge list of virtual production resources, be it the Epic Field Guide, be it presentations held by, by our colleagues in the industry, be it links to further resources, then download Unreal Engine. Unreal Engine is free. You download the, uh, the app, you download Unreal Engine, you download a virtual production scene, and you can go. There are YouTube videos from Epic, To, to learn how to use those tools. It's really, it's, it's, it's really all at fingertips. 
where do you see is like which production has the most benefit for independent filmmaker? Where do you feel like that's the one that if you have this kind of situation, you should have a look at this, even if you're maybe not familiar now, but this would be a, a lot of value for you. The example mentioned with um, having a shoot outside at a certain time of day you need to maintain, be it dusk, dawn or, or golden hour or something. This is where something like this can help. It's um, when you have to jump locations. When you're like, okay, uh, today I'm in Hawaii, tomorrow I am in New York, tomorrow I'm there. You have the, the sheer logistics of moving the key people around in hotels, travel, uh, environmental impact. This is when it becomes interesting to look at a virtual production stage. Other virtual production tools like, uh, okay, I have, a, I have visual effects shots and I have uh, people in shiny armor, Mandalorian, for example. You don't per se need the LED volume in the background, but you might want to consider having LED panels above you, which uh, give you the, the lighting to get the real reflections. So your visual effects team later on does not need to create reflections because they came with the plate instead of green spill. Another, another great resource to look at is if you go on dnec.com, and under the blog, you find uh, our virtual production innovation project, where we literally try to, to create a video around all of the key areas of virtual production and where you also see how it could be used. And you have actors talking about it, directors talking about it, DPs talking about it, production designers talk about it. And it really gives you an idea of how these different departments uh, interact, how these different departments can use this new technology, new, uh, this technology as, as a collaboration tool. How did you start and then, then transition into this area specifically? Where do you want to start? Do you want to start at the <laughs> beginning, beginning, or do you want to start, uh, I don't know, six years ago? You're out of school or whatever. You have to choose a university or a job or something like that. And a lot of time, a lot of people struggle to connect what they like or what they're interested in or whatever with an actual realistic path that they can do. So I think that is definitely the first path is like, how did you figure out you want to go in this maybe direction or how did you pivot into this direction and, and combine and then figure out, for example, to become a producer at first, at the first place. When I was 15 years old, I was in school in Germany and we got a project to uh, create a made up company, which is already pretty cool for a school to do, right? I Let's remember make up this. A company. I think we did that too. I think that's a thing, isn't it? It's a, it's a thing. Yes. And um, I realized quite quickly that a made-up company is a waste of energy. I asked my parents if I can open up a real company, which obviously needs approval from parents, because if you're below 18 in Germany, it's, uh, you're, you're not of legal age. And I also learned that even as, as the head of a company, as a director of a company below 18, you're not of legal age. Parents still need to sign every paper. So, but... I opened up this company and I started going into a demand, which it was, the company was founded in 2001. And this demand was websites. This was when the web started to grow. Everyone wanted a website. Nobody was there to do them. So I made websites. Uh, from websites, I went into software development. From software development, I went into uh, system engineering. And uh, then I got to the point where I kind of got bored of it. And, and it, it was also aligned with graduating from school. And my parents were like, oh, yeah, you have to go to uni. You have to go to uni. You have to study. You have to study. What do you want to study? Something was media because obviously web design stuff, media, right? I was like, nah, I'm going to study automotive engineering. So I studied automotive engineering for, I, I don't know what you call it in English, but basic, basically to your pre-diploma. And uh, it turned out higher mathematics is higher mathematics when you start to explain why a binome is a binome, it becomes really tricky. And I, to, to the disappointment of my parents, quit my studies and moved to Cologne to work uh, as, a, as a trainee at one of the, well, actually the first gaming television stations in the world. Giga, where I did games journalism, 
and I learned about journalism. And then I went from journalism at Giga, games journalism, and online. This was streaming. This was streaming like, I don't know, 15. There was no Twitch. There was no YouTube. There was no. We streamed. And from that, I went to story producing Big Brother. So I, I was producer on reality TV. In Germany, it's super famous. Like everyone knows Big Brother in Germany. So I did two seasons of that. And I was like, yeah. Okay, I was always I was always doing other things as a side because you have to imagine in Germany working for TV, uh, you're you're very seldom an employee. You're mostly a contractor, so you're basically going from contract to contract to contract based on the projects you're working on. So I was always trying to do something uh, aside. So I was uh, directing, editing corporate films, and. At the time, and I'm going to own up to uh, how I presented myself. I presented myself as a visual effects artist because I did motion graphics and 3D animation. Today, I would say what I did would not be any qualification I would consider to hire a visual effects artist. Any. It was really bad. Motion graphics was okay. But I mean, you have to, to think of the time, you know, like it was just, it looked different. Oh, it was yeah. YouTube wasn't still not that much of a tutorial thing for that kind of category. So hey, I did one 3D animation with a character, and out of the lack of knowledge how to rig a character, I animated the model. Visual effects artist. <laughs> See, <laughs> easy for for everyone around you. You were a visual effects artist. You know, you know, yeah, exactly. you open a 3D software. Me doing this and me being happy about doing this made a friend of mine say when i ask him for a job in another reality tv show you go to a film academy in ludwigsburg you study film and i was like eh i work for this big reality tv uh, company <sighs> okay i'm gonna try so i tried out got accepted and i suddenly was studying animation and visual effects producing which was the very, very first year this was offered as, a, as, as studies at this university. And I'm like, okay, I need to make this count because I'm coming from, from a good paycheck to zero money. To actually, I'm spending money every day. And so I tried to get everything I could take. Thanks to uh, the trust of a visual effects supervisor I had as a tutor, I landed a job as a junior producer at Pixel Mondo half a year into my studies. Mm, Pixamondo Stuttgart, probably then. Pixamondo Stuttgart, correct. I really own, uh, owe a lot to, to him and, and uh, the former head of the studio for trusting in me and letting me do what I did. And I think it was a one, one year in or something when we did our end presentations, year end presentations, what we did. Part of that was Game of Thrones Season 2 I put in my presentation. So I was associate producer on Game of Thrones Season 2, which was obviously not what they wanted to it see. It was cheating. In a, <laughs> <laughs> in a film academy presentation, it's definitely cheating. <laughs> and I ended up finishing my studies after two and a half years mm -hmm. at Film Academy and, and then stayed in visual effects. So I, I, I worked at Pixamondo. I worked at... Fischblown Bubbles, which is an animation studio in Munich. I worked at Scanline. And from Scanline, I then got uh, hired to uh, work at MPC in Montreal. This is when, when I moved to Montreal, about six years ago now, and started doing really, really big projects. And I started enjoying doing really big projects. And even more, I started enjoying working with really big teams. And at some point, it was time for me to take a break. So uh, my wife and I took three, four months off, took a break, went to LA, enjoyed the sun, like you in Hawaii. And, um, and after that, I started working at DNEC as an executive producer, did several shows, produced a couple of shows, and then got given the opportunity to become executive in charge corporate strategy and really look at at, at challenging the industry, challenging at the processes we are doing. And this is something I always wanted to do. And it's, it's, I, I can only thank, thank, thank my boss for giving me this opportunity. It's, it's really, really interesting. And it's something different every day. It's, it's really cool. 
And you get to see the world. I spend time in India, spend time in LA, spend time in London, meet the crew around the world, see uh, see how different cultures work. It's 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 really eye opening. And I mean, you're you're traveling a lot. You're you're seeing the world. And and I, I guess it's the same reasons, right? Yeah. I mean, for me, it's it's about communication. It's literally uh, like one of the things that I decide is like I would like to have my guests live online. Sadly, I'm not in Montreal at the moment, so we couldn't meet personally. But that's actually one of part of my goal is like uh, communicating, learning different cultures, you know, uh, and like just kind of em embrace that in yourself. But also for the podcast, like having the chance to meet people in person. It's just a different vibe to be in the same area as they just can feel the environment. The funny thing, I just, uh, the first episode ever I did with Paul Kaniak from Pixar, and we just recorded the first episode for season three, also with Paul Kaniak. And now I was live in his, in his garden, basically, literally behind him, he was his the shed that where he's working because he's working remote so it was kind of interesting to be like you know do this first thing remote before the pandemic and during the pandemic basically be live in there but just like being in berkeley uh, near the pixar studio where he lives uh, all the environment you can also see how much it influenced also like the pixar movies in their style like san francisco specifically in their style and the feel and stuff like that it's just yeah, you can feel that. So I, that's basically a little bit on on that side. So I can totally uh, understand that. And for me, like especially, I think everyone can relate. Is kind of like being stuck for two years at home, and uh, all the benefits of remote. And we had this discussion with Florian Gellinger, and also I did that with Paul Kaniak. Actually, it's great, but there's some degree of like I like to be in person. I like to have, you know, like especially like or even on cooperative situation, you'd like to shake hands, you know, with someone and you know, like there's so much kind of trust going if you meet someone in person compared to, you know, just uh, a call and stuff like that, especially if someone asks you something, you know, like give me your password kind of situation, you know, that's on the, or know give that. me your money kind of situation, uh, you know, that's just such a big difference in person than remote, basically. Welcome to our short mid episode coffee break. If you love the content and would like to have a successful career in the film or games industry yourself, check out my website, 21 Artist Show. Com. There you can find helpful articles, masterclasses and coaching opportunities that help dozens of my students to bring their profession to the next level. That's all. Check out 21artistshow.com and share the podcast with cool people you know. Let's continue with the episode. What was the moment that you felt like you found the job or the position that you want to aspire to or want to put energy in. I'm someone all for building processes, building path in life. And um, I'm going to ask, uh, answer your question with a book recommendation. There's a book called One Thing. It was life changing for me because at the end, we need to be able to focus on one thing. And this is what makes us happy. And the question is, what makes you happy? So sitting down and actually contemplating about what makes you happy is actually fairly rewarding, but still very energy demanding process. And what I found is a higher goal and, and a goal till I'm 40. So I still have three years till I'm 40. So if you're hearing this in three years from now, uh, please check my IMDb and see if I succeeded in my goal. But my higher goal is to enable people to do what they love. And this means working on projects they love, in an environment they love, in an environment they belong. This means sitting in front of the TV, sitting in front of or in a theater, and just forgetting about the craziness going on in the world. Just making people happy. That's, that's ultimately what I, what I want to do. Enable people to do what they love. That's my long term, my, my unreachable goal. Because it will never be success. It will always be ongoing. And uh, the goal I set myself till I'm 40 is to produce my very first movie. And this is something I, I, I had shared with my, my boss. And this came all out of, I'm going to be very, very blunt with you. This came all out of a burnout I had at the end of Film Academy. 
Because I was like, why am I doing this to me? I was in a hospital for multiple weeks. Why? Why am I going to this? And this is when I, when I found this higher goal, because I want, I, want I, I want to see people happy. Is it something which is egoistic and driven out, driven out of me because I don't want to see sad people? Possibly. It's a conversation for my therapist and me. <laughs> um, but it's, 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 really, it's, it's really having a goal in life helps so much to move forward. And there's always this, this and, 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 and this was the moment when I was like, yes, I want to do that. And the movie I wrote, yes, I wrote a movie. I will never give it to anyone to read because I am not a script writer. Guys, you can download the, the script in the description down below if you want to read uh, 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 this movie. No, if you're, if you're three years from now, uh, you might be able to watch it. I don't know. <laughs> um, the entertainment industry has such a huge role in our daily lives and has, if used wisely, an influence in making things better. And this is what, what drives me. This is the moment when I realized This is what I want to do. I want to tell stories people can engage with. I want to enable people to tell stories people can engage with. And yes, uh, and I bet you have the same thing. If you look through our IMDb's, you're going to see a lot of movies where like... Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't watch some of them, to be honest. <laughs> I haven't watched some of I worked on. Um, so, but it's... it's That doesn't matter. It still made someone happy in the process. It still enabled someone to tell a story they wanted to tell. And this is this is what keeps me going. And I shared this with my boss and was like, yeah, if you want to produce a movie, produce a movie, go. It's really, really interesting. And it's and it's and and you notice I'm getting energized about just talking about it. It's it's really something which is so cool. And we have so much, so much at our fingertips of of uh It's, sometimes we forget about it. I, I remember we were we were working on um, Godzilla, and everyone was like, "Oh my gosh, we're so tired. We've done overtime. We've done this and that, and oh my gosh!" And you 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 basically get lost in the detail, right? It's like, "Oh my gosh, 30 effect stars per shot. This, that, there." more animation oh my gosh, we don't have enough artists here. We don't have enough that there. The render farm is just everyday problems, right? So what did we start to do is we started to do weekly meetings where we just started to appreciate everyone. It was like appreciation. It's not just an appreciation of the team. It's also an appreciation of the fact how many people are out there waiting for it. Because Godzilla, for example, has this huge community. They were waiting for it. They were like, oh my gosh, the last Godzilla. I did King of the Monsters, so not the, the last, last one, the last one before that. And, and, and people were like, oh, the movie before that, the 2004 Godzilla had Godzilla in for like two and a half minutes. And everyone was like, oh, I hope it's not going to be like that. And there were fan theories. There were, I don't know, I, I still remember there was a picture taken from, from some uh, production designer's office where you saw Ghidorah on a screen in the background. And everyone was like, oh, Ghidorah is going to be in the movie and this and there. And I was like, and, and everyone is, was so excited about it. And just sharing this excitement with the team gave a perspective of there's something more than just animating a shot, than just lighting five shots or something like this. Because there's so much more to it. And then you're in a theater when on opening night with hundreds of other people and they're enjoying your work it's it's just this energizing feeling and it's just amazing to see it's i remember I, 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 a short film i produced uh, at film academy an animated short got shown at a film festival and it was targeted to, towards children and children were in the audience and they actually laughed at the scenes where we wanted them to laugh I'm like, works it works And it's, it's, it's just so amazing to see people react to what we do. But sometimes we forget about it. Sometimes it's just the loom and gloom of, oh my gosh, I have to do this again. And oh, the supervisor gave me yet another note. Oh, the client did this and that. It's not about that. It's about what it's at the end. I think everyone can see it through the camera, uh, how much like, you know, like you, you're passionate about this specific thing, about like making movies, making a change. You know, through movies maybe, but also making a change behind the scene. Uh, at the same time, you know, we started with like how much virtual production can change people's lives, uh, how much uh, the way you you work with each other had changed people's life, and how much you the result that you produce 
you know, the movie that you give out uh, can change people's life or at least make them happy or something. And speaking of like Godzilla and, and Japanese culture um, and purpose at the same time, there's this concept of Ikigai in, in Japanese culture, which means basically finding purpose in life through like find purpose, but mostly like through work in general. It's basically you can become a sushi chef and that's your focus. That's your core belief. That is you. So you become so obsessed with becoming a sushi chef that you basically think, you know, there's, there's this movie Netflix, like Dreams of Sushi, I think. So you become so focused on that, but not in an unhealthy way, but more of a like, that's your purpose. You know, not burnout on a focus, but more of a, this is what, what you believe makes good in the world. This is what you believe can you can add to the world. By the way, guys, there's a free book on YouTube, Ikigai, audiobook. It's like seven hours or something like that. And they kind of describe the concept. And it's really cool because it basically shows that you live longer, actually, if you have the Ikigai, if you found your Ikigai, you know. And it can change. It doesn't have to be always the same Ikigai, but it's basically not just webbling around or or having this pseudo purpose you know this kind of like i become i want to become a youtuber or a tiktoker or rich or whatever this is, doesn't have meaning often because often it's more of a hidden something else you know you won't be want to become a youtuber or a tiktoker because you want the fame or recognition or that is actually the thing you, you don't really care as much about making youtube so for example mr beast or uh pewdiepie they're they love doing youtube actually they're like passionate about it but most youtuber this is for also for me as a platform i'm not here because i i love to make youtube videos i'm here because i like i love to make a video podcast that's and uh, YouTube is a great platform for a video podcast. If I go to music, I would go to Spotify and stuff like that. So I think Ikigai is something that helps to to do that. Just coming back to the to the like burnout situation is like, why do you think that you burn do you burn out and what what changed for you? What like because that is actually a topic that a lot of people I think struggle with. You know, burning out. I, I mean, I had a similar situation to Film Academy. I overworked for three months where I like literally worked like 16 hours a day because of the ITFS. I had free project as a TD and I was lead TD in one Animan. I was uh, lighting TD at uh, Drupal and I was um, Queso uh, doing support for After Effects and stuff. And I was literally like in the morning, I went home where the school kids going to school. I, I lay down at, uh, at my home and then during lunch, I went back to the film academy and the school kids came back, you know, going home basically. And that was like for three months. And afterwards, I, I was not really well for a few weeks and months. So I can relate to this. So my question would be a little bit like to kind of also help other people with that kind of situation. What do you think were the reason you burned out and what, does, what was the strategy to get out of that and may hopefully avoid it in the future? The reasoning was similar to yours. Uh, it's stretching yourself too thin, <laughs> likely not saying no enough, not sending, set, setting the right boundaries. Yeah, especially if you're new to something, you know, you, so you feel like you, you, you underperform, so you try to kind of, you know, compensate for that a little bit. Yeah, you compensate. And you might also not ask the right questions. You might also not ask for help because you think it's going to reflect bad on you. It's only in recent years that I... That I, that I started really diving into, into mental health and actually into the mental health of, of, of our industry and what we can do to make it better. So next to my day job, I'm also co-chair co of the Health and Wellbeing Committee at the Visual Effects Society. And we are focusing on what can we give as resources to, to our industry? What can we, what can we give to, to help our industry, to give pointers. So the Visual Effects Society, for example, if you're a member, you have access to a member assistance program, which is a phone number, which is on the website in the membership section for your part of the world, in your language of the world, in whatever you can call for free and get counseling. You get help, not only a mental health help, but uh, also legal help and other stuff, but uh, it was put in place to give people the opportunity to have somewhere to call, someone to talk to. What we've also done was last year to produce a webinar series around mental health. So we, we had two psychiatrists and a clinical psychologist talk with people like John Dykstra, talk with people like, like an animation director and 
a producer, a visual effects supervisor, and just talk about topics like, okay, how do I have a work-life balance? So John Dykstra, for example, talks about work-life balance with two psychiatrists and a clinical, clinical psychologist. Very, very interesting. Our animation director, Mark, talk, talks, with, talks with the same group of people about imposter syndrome as a director of Kung Fu Panda. I think the first step is always the acknowledgement of there's something I need to invest into something. I need to investigate a little bit further. I need to acknowledge something is, is not going right. I, I feel tired. I feel, I feel like I don't care about things I used to care. A lot of telltale signs for burnout. And it's, it's okay. That's the thing. It's really okay. And the, the, the beautiful thing is in the last couple of years, I have started to see people wake up to it and start to openly talk about it. I can very proudly say I have a therapist. I'm seeing my therapist on a weekly basis. And it's an utterly amazing experience. Because a therapist is not there to solve your problems. A therapist is there to help you understand yourself. So sometimes my therapist is asking a question. I'm like, <sighs> yeah, no, I've never thought about it this way, but thank you. Now it's very, very conscious. And uh, yep, okay, cool. Yep, okay, now I know why I'm doing something like this. So it's 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 really really refreshing to 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 work with with therapists to talk with friends openly about your mental health. If it's like okay, I'm feeling burned out. Why are you feeling burned out? Are you feeling burned out because it's too much overtime? Are you feeling bur burned out because something in your private life is going wrong? Are you feeling burned out because your supervisor is, is not nice? And I mean not nice in a nice way of saying it. Are you feeling burned out because production sets unrealistic targets? It's all about communication. We need to talk to each other. We need to, we need to help each other. We need to acknowledge each other. And sometimes we need to admit, okay, it might actually be really good to talk to someone professional. And the first step is always go to your general physician, say, this is how I'm feeling. Uh, can I get, can I get a, a, I don't know what the English word is, a referral to a psychologist and talk to a psychologist about it. And suddenly you see there's a complete new world. There's a world you haven't looked at about yourself. It's really amazing. The bad thing about burnout uh, as a kind of a sickness uh, is basically it's you don't notice it yourself most of the time. And it's like until you burn out, basically, while other people mostly notice or have like the capacity to notice it. I remember like I had a supervisor and he was a dick, like literally. Um, but uh, he was like on the edge of burnout. It was obvious. It was like combined with both, you know. He was burning himself up and created this environment of being much more kind of like aggressive and challenging other people, like, you know, very un unpleasantly kind of like, you know, you can see that, but he basically pushed everyone away at the same time. So it was kind of like, even if you try to, you know, help this person and you kind of notice that he has problems and that kind of reflects back to other people, uh, you, there's just like, he just pushed, continued pushing and continued pushing. And uh, yeah, it was like nothing to do there to, to help them. I think that is one of the biggest problem in burnout is to recognize it even, you know, to recognize that you, that you are working because that's the thing you are, you have, you're so scheduled, basically you don't have time to think. You know, you basically, you constantly, I know a lot of people, their, their schedule is full all day. They, if they work, uh, if they don't work, they basically are in the gym or if they're in a gym, they're, they're meeting friends or if they're meeting friends, they're working or, you know, like basically always constantly jumping from one situation to another. You're absolutely right. It's, uh, it's, and, and, and this is, this is, <laughs> it's actually the craziest bit. It's, it's when, when you talk with people about it, uh, of looking for help right looking for help it's the first step look for help usually what you get is uh i don't have time for that i don't have the energy for that mm. we as humans tend to find excuses for everything sure and um there's a there's a there's a concept uh, everyone who has flown on uh, flown on a plane has heard the speech of put the oxygen mask on first 
and then help your ch the child next to you. Because if you can't breathe, you can't help the child. So it's really, really important to, to uh, understand the telltale signs. And really, Google it. Burnout, bur burnout symptoms. Get those signs in your head. They just added a new thing to that one. Uh, please remove your mask before applying. That. Really? <laughs> it's literally like, yo, know, you cannot, you cannot put your hamster into the microwave. You know, dangerous. It will not dry. It only, you know. So there is an element of stupidity now in there. But um, yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think um, that is also a big problem sometimes. You know, um, like also like uh, healthcare people are actually pr predestined to be burnout. Because like people who help other people generally are very because they're kind of like ignore themselves much more and then they end up working for other people like basically or, or, or people in management or something like that you know they're just so, so focused on other people's problems uh, less than themselves and I think that is probably kind of a telltale sign if you are working in a management healthcare industry you definitely have should have a look first as like am I going in the burnout and am I have time for myself basically one of the things that I implemented for myself is I always uh, like to have a long morning it's just a thing for me you know where I'm like have a an hour in the morning where I just I don't know wake up slowly sit at a coffee table drink my coffee I don't know listen to music read something nothing fancy just sometimes just sit there and look out and stuff like that for me, not having a stressful morning where I rush things, breakfast or drinking or like, you know, coffee or whatever, uh, clothing and then going outside or something like that, or, or in, in modern case is just like putting something on, opening the laptop and, and in the meeting, I think that is an important thing. It's just having time to, you know, start the motor in the in the morning having time to maybe reflect even you know like you can think mm -hmm. about what you will do today or what happened yesterday or just not not think at all like just kind of like waking up um is so important compared to oh i can just wake up five minutes before the meeting or i can just rush out take my coffee and uh, you know on the way i go to starbucks or whatever you know so i think that for me is actually one of the things like starting your day well is definitely something where i can just recommend if, if you don't have time for that personally i think there's a problem because uh for me personally i feel like starting a day slowly kind of opens the day basically for the rest you know less stressful you know you're less likely to be stressed by things because you kind of like already started like because that's the thing if you start a day stressful everything kind of starts to bug you even more i feel like agreed very much agreed and this is this is something we've been discussing with with the specialists on the on the webinar series called reignite yourself it's on youtube podcasting platforms you know them better than i free for your disposal to listen or watch and it, it's really, it's, it's having a morning routine. Having routines in general help. Um, there's, there's so much. And, and the specialists in there talk about tools you can do like journaling, meditation, yoga, just, just exercises to, to center yourself, exercises to reflect yourself. Because at the end, we need to reflect ourselves more. We need to understand ourselves better. And then we can move forward. And uh, something I tend to do, people tend to do, is using my the person I'm talking to as a mirror, right? It's like, oh yeah, you're you're unreasonable. Yeah, like likely I'm unreasonable. Uh, that is actually the the big thing at the end of the day. Uh, like the morning routine or morning quietness is actually basically the end result is having time for silence and or reflection something in that depending what you need at this moment so if you don't and it can be at the gym if you have the the mental mentality for that you know if it's not just like i'm doing my routine and that's it if, if that's part for, for me it's for example cooking and eating i love that this is something where i rewind like rewind a little bit you know uh, dinner cooking dinner and then eating it's basically something like just the cooking is for me very relaxing and uh, i kind of enjoy it and feel like creative also at the same time and listening to music at the same time so this is something where i, I definitely know it kind of uh you know puts the stress away but combine that with the morning routine where i feel like i'm starting into the day i kind of have this uh elements not every day but i try to make it as often as possible generally every day i try to do one of of these two things um and i think that is that's kind of the one of the biggest strategies you should have is like having 
at least once a day something where it regenerates you or quiets you or something like that and you're not just like a slave of your calendar basically because that is something that i feel like a lot of people end up like the busier you are the more you feel valuable you know the more you feel kind of strong because you feel like you know you're contemplating you're doing something all the time while at the moment you're not doing something you end up like this you know like that's also a thing, you know, like being in a train or something, a lot of people are in buses, they're basically always on their phones. And I feel that's exactly the moment where you can have a quiet time, realize what's going on around you, maybe listen to an audiobook, but actively, not just like, just to, to kind of like speed up time, you know? It's basically like, you know, the power of now, <laughs> like let's bring all this thing back together. It's a little bit, you know, being aware of things. It doesn't matter what you do, but just being aware and not just using the, you know, the loading screens basically in between as something you need to fill out with bullshit, basically. I think that if you do, if you do that, I think that is already a great way to like get away from the clutches of burnout, for example. Very much agreed. Yeah. Being open about these kind of things helps you to build a different kind of teams and work differently and create a sense of belonging for the team. Because that's something which is very dear to my heart. Dr. Drea Letamendi, she has a podcast called Arkham Stories, where she's basically looking at superheroes, Batman or whatsoever, or Marvel movies, and uh, analyzing the psychology behind it. It's really interesting. It reminds me on Cinema Therapy, a YouTube channel, and they basically look at, at, at general movies, you know, very famous movies mostly, but they also have a section about superheroes, like Iron Man has PTSD, for example. So that's why he reacts throughout the movies like this crazy, I need to save the world person and stuff like that. And yeah, that's also like super nice and they kind of go dive into Pixar movies and stuff like that and see about like mm -hmm. parenthood. And so that's kind of, yeah, I kind of love that if you if you can find uh, or or discuss even if it's like passively with with uh, this kind of show a little bit deeper into the psychology of things and understand what is the point of Shawshank Redemption that like makes so many people like this movie and feel connected to the movie even if you know there's a criminal uh, guy in uh, there in basically in in prison for most of his life there so what is the connection to that and still like an amazing movie for example fight club best best psychology thing you know like mm -hmm. what is masculinity and stuff like that it's actually nowadays a very appropriate movie that that i find find it has become even more stronger throughout the years actually i don't know if if the head of uh, Film Academy was saying the same when you started there. The opening speech of the year, he was basically saying, if you have a movie you like, watch it until you figure out why you like it. And it's, it's actually really strong advice. I think ultimately what it, what it all boils down to, in, in at least my approach to life, my approach to producing is, I want to create an environment where people belong, where people where people think they can be themselves, where people think they can can contribute on every level, and where you can create something together. Because this is, is ultimately the, the, the cool part about our industry. Look at the credits of the movie. There are thousands of people, and all of them do their part to bring this thing on screen. It's just amazing. It's uh, and, and if you create a an environment where everyone feels like they're a part of it you you can you tell stories which are rich you tell stories people care about and and you even 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 better create friendships i have so many friends i got through this industry through working together it's it's just an utterly beautiful thing i couldn't say it better thank you very much philip for for joining us today and also sharing First one, your unique job position at the moment. I think that's something also, and in a way that was also one of the reasons we're talking to you is to, to ins maybe inspire other people like that this job position can exist in a company and maybe someone else will be like, oh, well, I want to do that. That sounds awesome. Maybe I can create a niche in my own company for that one. So I think that was fantastic. And also talking a little bit about like purpose and like, to find that a little bit and how much it can prevent you from burning out, for example. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me.
That's it with this week's episode of the 21 Artist Show. Thank you so much for watching and listening. This podcast is 100% ad free. And to keep it that way, check out my website, 21artistshow.com. There you can find exclusive access to awesome masterclasses and coaching opportunities to work successfully in visual effects, animation, and games. Just go to 21artistshow.com. And don't forget to share it with people who would benefit from that content and tell them they're awesome. See you on the next episode. Next on the 21 Artist Show. Deep down, I knew this industry, this business, this form of entertainment will never go away. Will never go away. It will, it will, it can only grow. What it has become, I wouldn't have known at the time. But that this was just a fad, no way. That was, that was, that was just, there's just no way. I mean, once you experience playing games yourself and you know, you, you put yourself in other people's shoes and yeah, they're gonna like it. You just have to, you know, develop the, the right game for them. Not everybody will like everything, but this wasn't gonna go away.